the jewels that lately vanished My mother has retrieved For Kaz and Khan is banished And Marlow much deceived The inn was an illusion He found out far too late To add to his confusion His sweet on sister Kate George Hastings is dejected And Marlow's father here Not quite what was expected But resolution's near This union of our family Will make our personal friendships hereditary <laughs> And though my daughter's fortune is but small... Why, Dick, will you talk of fortune to me? My son is possessed of more than a competence already and can want nothing but a good and virtuous girl to share his happiness and increase it. If they like each other, as you say they do. If, man, hmm? I tell you they do like each other. My daughter as good as told me so. Yes, but girls are apt to flatter themselves, you know. I saw him grasp her hand in the warmest manner myself. And here he comes to put you out of your ifs, I warrant him. Mm. I come, sir, once more to ask pardon for my strange conduct. I can scarce reflect on my insolence without confusion. Tut, boy, a trifle. You take it too gravely. An hour or two's laughing with my daughter will set all to rights again. She'll never like you the worse for it. Sir, I shall always be proud of her approbation. Approbation is but a cold word, Mr. Marlowe. If I'm not deceived, you have something more than approbation thereabouts. You take me? Really, sir, I have not that happiness. Come, come, I'm an old fellow and knows what's what as well as you that are younger. I know what has passed between you. But, Mum... Well, sir, nothing has passed between us. But the most profound respect on my side and the most distant reserve on hers. You don't think, sir, that my impudence has been passed upon all the rest of the family? Impudence? No, I don't say that. Not quite impudence. Though girls like to be played with and rumpled a little too sometimes. But she's told no tales, I assure you. I never gave her the slightest cause. Well, well, I like modesty in its place well enough, but this is overacting, young gentleman. You may be open. Your father and I will like you the better for it. May I die, sir, if I ever... I tell you she don't dislike you, and as I'm sure you like her... Dear sir, I protest, I see sir. no reason why you can't be joined as fast as the parson can tie you. But hear me, Your sir. father approves the match. I admire it. Every moment's delay will be doing a mischief, so... But why won't you hear me? By all that's just and true... I never gave Miss Hardcastle the slightest mark of my attachment, or even the most distant hint to suspect me of affection. We had but one interview, and that was formal, modest, and uninteresting. This fellow's formal, modest impudence is beyond bearing. And you never grasped her hand or made any protestation? As heaven is my witness, I came down in obedience to your commands. I saw the lady without emotion and parted without reluctance. I hope you'll exact no further proofs of my duty, nor prevent me from leaving a house in which I suffer so many mortifications. But I'm astonished at the air of sincerity with which he parted. And I'm astonished at the deliberate intrepidity of his assurance. Well, I dare pledge my life and honour upon his truth. Here comes my daughter. I'll stake my happiness upon her veracity. Kate, come hither, child. Answer us sincerely and without reserve. Has Mr Marlowe made any professions of love and affection? Oh, the question is very abrupt, sir. But... Since you require unreserved sincerity, I think he has. You see? And pray, madam, have you and my son had more than one interview? Uh, yes, sir, several. You see? But did he profess any attachment? A lasting one. Did he talk of love? Uh, much, sir. Amazing. And all this formally? Formally. Now, my friend, I hope you are satisfied. Uh, but how did he behave, madam? As most professed admirers do. 
said some civil things of my face, talked much of his want of merit and the greatness of mine, mentioned his heart, gave a short tragedy speech, and ended with pretended rapture. Now, I'm perfectly convinced indeed. I know his conversation among women to be modest and submissive, and this forward, canting, ranting manner by no means describes him. And I'm confident he never sat for the picture. Then what, sir, if I should convince you to your face of my sincerity? If you and my papa, in about half an hour, will place yourselves behind that door, you shall hear him declare his passion to me in person. Agreed. And if I find him what you describe, all my happiness in him must have an end. And if you don't find him what I describe, I fear my happiness must never have a beginning. takes a delight in mortifying me. He never intended to be punctual, and I'll wait no longer. What do I see? It is he, and perhaps with news of my constancy. My honest squire, I now find you a man of your word. This looks like friendship. Aye, I'm your friend, and the best friend you have in the world of you, new but all. This riding by night by the by is cursedly tiresome. Shut me worse than the basket of a stagecoach. But how, where did you leave your fellow travellers? Are they in safety? Are they housed? Mm. Five and twenty miles in two hours and a half is no such bad driving. The poor beasts have smoked for it. Rabbit me, I'd rather ride forty miles after a fox than ten with such vermin. Well, but where have you left the ladies? I die with impatience. Left them? Why, where should I leave them but where I found them? This is a riddle. Riddle me this, then. What's that? Goes round the house and round the house and never touches the house. I'm still astray. That's it, man. I've led them astray. By Jingo, there's not a pond or slough within five miles of the place but they can tell the taste of. <laughs> I, I understand. You took them in a round while they supposed themselves going forward. And so you have at last brought them home again. You shall hear. I first took them down Featherbed Lane, where we stuck fast in the mud. I then rattled them crack over the stones and up and down hill. I then <laughs> introduced them to the gibbet on Heavy Tree Heath, and from that, with a circumbendibus, I fairly lodged them in the horse pond at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> but no accident, I hope. No, no. Only Mother is confoundedly frightened. She thinks herself 40 miles off. She's sick of the journey and the cattle can scarce crawl. So, if your own horses be ready, you may whip off with Cousin, and I'll be bound no soul here can budge a foot to follow you. My dear friend, how can I be grateful? Aye, now it's dear friend, noble squire. Just now it was all idiot cub and run me through the guts. Damn your way of fighting, I say. After we take a knock in this part of the country, we kiss and be friends. But if you'd run me through the guts, then I'd be dead. You might go kiss the hangman. The rebuke is just. But I must hasten to relieve Miss Neville. If you keep the old lady employed, I promise to take care of the young one. Never fear me. Here she comes. Vanish. She's got from the pond and dragged up to the waist like a mermaid. Oh, Tony, I'm killed, shook, battered to death. I shall never survive it. That last jolt that laid us by the quickset hedge has done my business. Oh. Alack, Mama, it was all your own fault. You would be for running away by night without knowing one inch of the way. I wish we were at home again. I never met so many accidents in so short a journey. Drenched in the mud. Overturned in a ditch, stuck fast in a slough, jolted to a jelly, and at last to lose our way. Whereabouts do you think we are, Tony? By my guess, we should be upon Crack Skull Common, <laughs> about 40 miles from home. Oh, Lord. The most notorious spot in all the country. 
We only need a, a robbery to make a complete night on. Don't be afraid, Mama. Don't be afraid. Two of the five that kept here are hanged, and the other three may not find us. Oh. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> Is that a man that's galloping behind us? <laughs> oh, no. It's only a tree. Don't be afraid. <laughs> the fright will certainly kill me. Do you see anything like a black hat moving behind the thicket? Oh, death! <laughs> <laughs> no, it's only a cow. Oh. Don't be afraid, oh. Mama. Oh. Don't be afraid. Oh, oh. he's on the live pony. I see a man coming towards us. I am sure, Aunt. If he perceives us, we're undone. <laughs> Father-in-law, by all that's unlucky, come to take one of his night walks. It's a highwayman with pistols as long as my arms. A damn ill-looking oh. fellow. Go, go, go. Good heaven, defenders, he approaches. Do you hide yourself in that oh. thicket? Leave me to manage him. Oh. Oh. If there be any danger, I'll cough and cry out. When I cough, be sure to keep close. Oh. 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 I'm mistaken, or I heard... Voices of people in want of help. Oh, Tony, is that you? I did not expect you so soon back. Are your mother and a charge in safety? Uh, very safe, sir. My aunt pedigrees. <clears throat> uh, I find there's danger. Forty miles in three hours? Sure, that's too much, my youngster. Stout horses and willing minds make short journeys, as they say. <coughs> sure, he'll do the dear boy no harm. But I heard a voice here. I shall be glad to know from whence it came. Uh, it, it was I, sir. Uh, I was talking to myself, sir. I, I was saying, 40 miles in four hours was very good going. <clears throat> As to be sure it was. <clears throat> uh, I've got a sort of cold by being out in the air. <clears throat> we'll go in, if you please. But if you talked to yourself, you did not answer yourself. I'm certain I heard two voices and am resolved to find the other out. Oh, he's going to find me out. <laughs> what need you go if I tell you, sir? <clears throat> I'll lay down my life for the truth. <clears throat> I'll tell you, I'll tell you all. <clears throat> I'll tell you, I'll not be detained. I insist on seeing. It's in vain to expect I'll believe oh, you. Oh, Lord, he'll murder my poor boy. <laughs> my darling. <laughs> Here, good gentleman. Wet your rage upon me! <laughs> Take my money, my life, but spare that young gentleman. Spare my child if you have any mercy. <laughs> my wife, as I'm a Christian. But from whence does she come and what does she mean? Take compassion on us, good Mr. Highway Man. Take our money, our watches, all we have but spare our lives. We will never bring you to justice. Indeed, we won't, good Mr. Highwayman. I believe the woman's out of her senses. What? <laughs> Dorothy! <laughs> don't you know me? <laughs> Mr. Hardcastle, I'm alive. But, but my, my fears blinded me. It, that was, but, 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 but who, my dear, would, would have expected to meet you here in, in this frightful place, so far from home? <laughs> What's brought you to follow us? Sure, Dorothy, you've not lost your wits. So far from home, when you are within 40 yards of your own front door? What the... This is one of your old tricks, you graceless rogue, you! What? Don't you know the gate? Oh. And the mulberry tree? Don't you remember the horse pond, my dear? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> I shall remember the horse pond as long as I live. <laughs> I've caught my death in it. And it is to you, you graceless harlot, that I owe all this. I'll teach you to abuse your mother, I will. All the parish says you have spoilt me, and so you may take the fruits on. Else. 
for you, I will! There's morality, however, in his reply. My dear Constance, why will you deliberate thus? If we delay a moment, all is lost forever. Pluck up a little resolution, and we shall soon be out of reach of her malignity. I find it impossible. <laughs> My spirits are so sunk with the agitations I have suffered that I am unable to face any new danger. Two or three years' patience will at last crown us with happiness. Such a tedious delay is worse than inconstancy. Let us fly, my charmer. Let us date our happiness from this very moment. Perish fortune. Love and content will increase what we possess beyond a monarch's revenue. Let me prevail. No, Mr. Hastings, no. Prudence once more comes to my relief and I will obey its dictates. In the moment of passion, fortune may be despised, but it ever produces a lasting repentance. I'm resolved to apply to Mr. Hardcastle's compassion and justice for redress. But though he had the will, he has not the power to relieve you. But he has influence. And upon that, I am resolved to rely. I have no hopes. But since you persist, I must reluctantly obey you. What a situation am I in? If what you say appears, I shall then find a guilty son. If what he says be true, I shall lose one that of all others I most wish for a daughter. I am proud of your approbation, sir. And to show I merit it, if you place yourselves as I directed, you shall hear his explicit declaration. But he comes. I'll do your father and keep him to the appointment. Though prepared for setting out, I come once more to take leave. Nor did I, till this moment, know the pain I feel in the separation. I believe these sufferings cannot be very great, sir, which you can so easily remove. A day or two longer, perhaps, might lessen your uneasiness by showing the little value of what you think proper to regret. This girl, every moment, improves upon me. It must not be, madam. I've already trifled too long with my heart. My very pride begins to submit to my passion. The disparity of education and fortune, the anger of a parent and the contempt of my equals begin to lose their weight. And nothing can restore me to myself but this painful effort of resolution. Then go, sir. I'll urge nothing more to detain you. Though my family be as good as her as you came down to visit, and my education, I hope not, Inferior. What are these advantages without equal affluence? I must remain contented with the slight approbation of imputed merit. I must have only the mockery of your addresses. While all your serious aims are fixed on fortune. Yeah. Behind this door. I, I make no noise. I'll engage my Kate covers him with confusion at last. By heavens, madam, fortune was ever my smallest consideration. Your beauty, at first, caught my eye. For who could see that without emotion? But every moment I converse with you steals in some new grace, heightens the picture and gives it stronger expression. What at first seemed rustic plainness now appears refined simplicity. What seemed forward assurance now strikes me as the result of courageous innocence and conscious virtue. What can it mean? He amazes me. I told you how it would be. Hush. I'm now determined to stay, madam. And I have too good an opinion of my father's discernment when he sees you to doubt his approbation. No, Mr. Marlowe, I will not, cannot detain you. Do 
you think I could ever suffer a connection in which there is the smallest room for repentance? Do you think I would take the mean advantage of a transient passion to load you with confusion? Do you think I could ever relish that happiness which was acquired by lessening yours? By all that's good, I can have no happiness but what's in your power to grant me. Nor shall I ever feel repentance, but in not having seen your merits before, I will stay, even contrary to your wishes. And though you should persist to shun me, I will make my respectful assiduities atone for the levity of my past conduct. Sir, I must entreat you'll desist. As our acquaintance began, so let it end. In indifference. I might have given an hour or two to levity, but seriously, Mr. Marlowe, do you think I could ever submit to a connection where I must appear mercenary and you imprudent? Do you think I could ever catch at the confident addresses of a secure admirer? Does this look like security? Does this look like confidence? No, madam. Every moment that shows me your merit only serves to increase my diffidence and confusion. Here, let me continue. I can hold it no longer. Charles! Charles, why hast thou deceived me? Is this your indifference, your uninteresting conversation? Your cold contempt, your formal interview. What have you to say now? That I'm all amazement? What can it mean? It means you can say and unsay things of pleasure. That you can address a lady in private and deny it in public that you have one story for us and another for my daughter. Daughter? This lady, your daughter? Yes, sir, my only daughter, my Kate. Whose else should she be? Oh, the devil. Yes, sir, that very identical, tall, squinting lady you were pleased to take me for. She that you addressed as the mild, modest, sentimental man of gravity and the bold, forward, agreeable rattle of the ladies' club. Zooms, there's no bearing this. It's worse than death. In which of your characters, sir, will you give us leave to address you? As the faltering gentleman with looks on the ground that speaks just to be heard and hates hypocrisy? Or the loud, confident creature that keeps it up with Mrs. Mantrap and old Miss Biddy Buckskin till three in the morning? <laughs> Oh, curse my noisy head. I never attempted to be impudent yet that I was not taken down. I must be gone. By the hand of my body, and you shall not. I see it was all a mistake, and I'm rejoiced to find it so. You shall not, sir, I tell you. I know she'll forgive you. Won't you forgive him, Kate? We'll all forgive you. Take courage, man. <laughs> Oh, they've gone off. Let them go. I care not. Who gone? My dutiful niece and her gentleman, Mr. Hastings, from town. He that came down with our modest visitor here. Who? My honest George Hastings. As worthy a fellow as lives. And the girl could not have made a more prudent choice. Then, by the hand of my body, I'm proud of the connection. Well, if he's taken away the lady, he's not taken her fortune. That remains in this family to console us for her loss. Sure, Dorothy, you would not be so mercenary. Uh, that's my affair, not yours. But you know if your son, when of age, refuses to marry his cousin, her whole fortune is then at her own disposal. Aye, but he is not of age, and she has not thought proper to refuse him. What? Returned so soon? I begin not to like it. For my late attempts to fly off with your niece, let my present confusion be my punishment. But we are now come back to appeal from your justice to your humanity. By her father's consent, I first paid her my addresses, and our passions were first founded in duty. Since his death, I have been obliged to stoop to dissimulation to avoid oppression. In an hour of levity, I was ready even to give up my fortune to secure my choice. But I'm now recovered from the delusion and hope from your tenderness what is denied me from a nearer connection. 
This is but the waning end of a modern novel. Be it what it will, I'm glad they've come back to reclaim their due. Come hither, Tony boy. Do you refuse this lady's hand whom I now offer you? What signifies my refusal? You know I can't refuse her till I'm of age, father. Whilst I thought concealing your age, boy, was likely to conduce to your improvement, I concurred with your mother's desire to keep it secret. But since I find she turns it to a wrong use, I must now declare that you've been of age these three months. Of age? Am I of age, father? Above three months. Then you'll see the first use I make of my liberty. Witness all men, by these presents, that I, Anthony Lumpkin Esquire, of Wiverton Place, refuse you, Constantia Neville, spinster, of no place at all, for my true and lawful wife. So Constance Neville may marry whom she pleases, and Tony Lumpkin is his own man again. Oh, brave squire. My worthy friend. Undutiful offspring. Joy, my dear George, I give you joy sincerely. And could I prevail upon my little tyrant here to be less arbitrary, I should be the happiest man alive if you would return me the favour. Come, madam, you are now driven to the last scene of all your contrivances. I know you like him, I'm sure he loves you. And you must and shall have him. And I say so too. And Mr Marlowe, if she makes you as good a wife as she has a daughter, I don't think you'll ever repent your bargain. And so now to supper. Tomorrow we shall gather all the poor of the parish about us and the mistakes of the night shall be crowned with a merry morning. So, boy, take her. And as you have been mistaken in the mistress, my wish is you may never be mistaken in the wife. Ha, 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 ha.